Hi, everyone. I'm Richard Hananya. I'm here for the Salem Center, and I'm here today uh, talking with uh, Philippe Lemoine about epidemiology and all that has gone wrong with it today. Uh, Philippe, how are you doing? I'm great, thanks. So Philippe uh, came to Austin for part of the uh, Salem Center Texas Dream <laughs> Series. Um, how, have you liked, how did you like Austin? It was great. I wish I'd stay longer. Uh, I hope I'll stay longer next time. Yeah. Is it, you've been to the U.S. before? Uh, yeah, yeah. I lived in the U.S. for, for several years, you know, but I was, all, I was in New York State. Oh, so, that's uh, right. You're a PhD student at Cornell. What am I talking yeah, yeah, so about? I never, um, <laughs> yeah, I, ne I never, uh, it was my first time in Texas. You know I mean? I'd stopped once at uh, the Dallas airport on my way to Columbia for a conference, but that, uh -huh. that's the extent of uh, you know, my former presence to Texas. You know, that was the first time I was in Texas. <laughs> so you're first yeah. time outside of like the East Coast, basically? Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I've been in, I've been in LA, um, when was it? Three years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, but otherwise you're right. I think, um, I've been to various places on this coast, but yeah, you're right. Uh, other than LA three years ago, I don't think I'd been, uh, uh, on the West coast or, you know, in, uh, I've never been in the Midwest, for instance. I've never been to Texas. It was the first uh -huh. time. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. When I visited uh, Salem Center, that was that was actually also my first my first time in Texas. Uh, so great. I mean, we're glad, we're glad to do so, stuff with Salem, and uh, you know, Texas is interesting because when I was in Austin, it was um, it was uh, it, after the uh, it was during or maybe slightly near the end of the Omicron uh, wave, um, and uh, Austin is the most liberal place in in Texas by a long. Yeah. Uh, wide margin and the university of texas austin campus is the most liberal place um in austin texas um and there were fewer people masked um that i saw like i go to the tar i went to the target for example right outside even on campus but i went to the target right outside campus uh and there were fewer people masked than i saw even in los angeles like even in a store in the excerpts uh, of Los Angeles. It is an amazing difference, Texas versus uh, Southern California. And it was, it was strange. I mean, it was the first, we had, a, we had a little while in, uh, we had, we don't have a mask mandate anymore, but in LA County, we, we at that time we had been like, uh, you know, like a year and a half or more, just uh, mask mandates the whole time. Uh, maybe like we had a few months break and then like when Delta came back, they brought it back. Um, but Texas has basically been maskless, like, you know, the whole time or almost close to the whole time through the whole uh, coronavirus thing. Uh, and so I, at that point, when I was at Austin, I was used to a year and a half of everywhere I went, uh, almost everyone was masked, um, or everyone was masked. Uh, and it was like sort of a, a culture shock. And, you know, you say, oh, Austin is like this. And it's like, it's like sometimes you hear like, oh, like even within states, there's political polarization because you have the blue cities and you have like the red uh, suburbs and exurbs and, uh, and rural areas. But like, no, like the most liberal place in Texas was, you know, way, way more, you know, free on the coronavirus restrictions um, than, you know, just normal places in California. Um that was my impression. What, what, what was, what was uh, your impression as, as a Frenchman? Yeah, I mean, so I'm actually, I'm actually in San Francisco right now. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the contrast with Austin. So I was like, I just left Austin, uh, arrived in San Francisco, and already at the airport. Yeah. It was very clear, and it was pretty shocking. Like, uh, in Austin, even at the airport, like, almost nobody was masked. I mean, some, some people were masked, but, you know, like, I don't know, maybe like 10, 20% tops yeah. uh, of people were masked. And, but at the airport in San Francisco, uh, everyone was. And I took a train yesterday. And I was like literally the only person in the train not wearing a mask. So I've learned since then that it may have been because there's actually maybe there's still a mandate in the public transportation here. I don't know, but um, yeah, and there is an LA, LA County. There's still a mandate, but this stuff is not it's not really enforced. Uh, so you you could I yeah. walked around the airport at LAX with no mask under the mask mandate. No one no one ever said anything to me. So yeah. it, it's not so it's, it's not enforced. Uh, yeah, no, I definitely have the same impression. It's, it was quite striking, you know, like the. You know, I was joking on my way here that, um, you know, I felt like I was arriving in a different country. And I guess in a way I, I, I was, you know, like it's really, it's the same country, still the U.S., but uh, three strikes. So one thing I was, one question I was asking myself, you know, I said that on Twitter. And like, I wonder to what extent this reflects mostly, um, you know, an average difference in people's preferences with respect to masking. Or if actually people's preferences with respect to masking in Texas and, and California are, you know, quite similar, although, but it's just that, you know, there's a tipping point. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Once, you know, enough people 
have a preference for masking, you have like social mimicry that kicks in, and then you know you get the result where almost everyone is masking. Uh, and I don't know, you know, I don't know what it is. You know, I don't know if it's a or you know another possibility is just that really the average difference in people's preferences with respect to masking are just really huge between California and Texas. Yeah, but I don't know. Be that, they I can't mean, be that. They can't yeah, yeah, that's what that I'm thinking. Huge. That's what I, I, I was in. Um, so during the pandemic, I went to. Uh, uh, I went to um, uh, like uh, Bakersfield, which is sort of Eastern California. I was I was in there, uh, Lake Ar- Lake Arrowhead, um, and it was by an area that was like had a Republican congressman. Um, and if so, if you look at how people vote, like uh, you know, more way more conservative than uh, uh, than Austin, Texas, which is of course uh, very democratic and liberal. But it's the, yeah, you, at the tipping point. There must be a, some interaction. There must be a social mimicry, and there must be some interaction. Like Austin can't be an island. Like there must yeah. be an interaction with the wide Texas and the wider South, right? Um, yeah. And then California, if you have like a conservative area, it's also like in an ocean of like you know something different. Uh, and it's, it's you know it's fascinating, and you know we I, we're spending so much time on masking here, but it's like it's an interesting social question, and it's like a big deal. Like a cult, a cult, like if you go to Afghanistan and you're like a travel travel writer, like the first thing you remark about is, oh wow, look at the women, you know they're covering their faces. You know, yeah. a place that covers their face versus a place that they're not. That's like that's a huge cultural difference. I'm, I'm just shocked during this thing where people think it's like eh, you know whatever people wear. Yeah, no, no. It's like they're wearing I, I, hats or they're not wearing hats. You know, it's it's like no big deal. Yeah. But, but also, I mean, even if you think that, um, I still think it's a really interesting question because, you know, uh, the, the social processes at work here, they explain, you know, like, so the question I was asking, you know, whether it's just mostly preferences or there's this kind of tipping point thing that, that's, uh, that, you know, that kicks in and uh, that so that social mimicry kicks in and, you know, conformism and pe- everyone, you get everyone wearing a mask, even though, um, you know, the pr- people's preferences are not that different with Texas. Uh, you know, this sort of things, you know, those processes are going to apply to a lot of other questions. So I think it's mm, interesting yeah. to think about how it works in this case, because it's going to, you know, the similar things are going on and, you know, are going to explain, probably explain a lot of things about, you know, how societies in general work. So yes. even if you don't, and I agree with you that it's a much bigger deal than a lot of people make it sound. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, people like, so I was teaching, this semester I was teaching a, a course on uh, epidemic modeling at Sciences Po, the school in, in Paris. Mm. And um, there was a mass mandate for until like mid March. So until mid March, you know, I realized at some point that like, just before the mass mandate was lifted, and you know, we could I could teach without a mask, and my students didn't have to wear a mask in class. I realized that I had been teaching that course for like two months at this point, and I still didn't know most of my students. I still couldn't put a name on uh, on most of my, or rather, still couldn't put a face on most of my students' uh, names. Because the mask really like made it really hard to uh, identify them, you know, and like put a put a face on their name. And whereas, you know, when I taught in the past, uh, typically after like two or three classes, uh, I'd be able to put a face on every every yeah. name. In well, yeah, your class. evolutionary priors here. I mean, the human ability to recognize faces. It's like one of those things they can't teach artificial intelligence because evolution has shaped you so well. And it's not just to recognize who people are. It's to read emotions. It's to tell personality. The, you know, your, your priors here should be like, this is so fundamental to human communication. And then you see these people and oh, you have a peer-reviewed study that like if you mask kids for their whole lives, like, it, it, you know, it's like, it's, it, it's just ridiculous. It's just a ridiculous belief in like you know peer review and scientism and not not willing to apply like theory and like common sense to to human affairs people say people say insane things about the kids especially i just think it's just so weird to be like even not even citing necessarily studies you know not that it's better uh when you have studies to back that up but like because they're you know they're crap you know generally but um it just seems like it's one of those things where it's just like common sense that you know there's just it's just like of course, it's going to be bad for, you know, I have no idea what exactly the consequences would be if they, you know, yeah. they stayed like this. But, you know, it's just, it's one of those things where I don't even want to argue about it because it's just like, it seems that anyone who's not like, whose brain has not been like completely destroyed by yeah. uh, ideology is going to see that, you know, it's not, it shouldn't be a, it shouldn't be something that people dispute, you know, you know, you can argue if masks were like more effective than I think they are, maybe during yeah. the height of the pandemic, you know, okay, maybe that's a good idea to have them, but, but you shouldn't be saying stuff like, Oh, it's no big deal. You know, even they kept the mask for the rest of their lives. You know, or, or oh, if, you know, if we kept, yeah. you know, if we put mask on kids uh, for you know, uh, for like another century at school, just like yeah. I mean, come on, it's just like anyone who has like 
a little bit of common sense can see that this is crazy. But yeah, I don't even yeah. want to argue about this. It's on, you know, I like to argue about most things, but there's sometimes I'm like, okay, <laughs> yeah, I, I, some things are too depressing to argue about. It's like, yeah, uh, I mean, you know, I, I think you know when when you there are some things when you you need to argue with someone about those things, you're like, it's probably not worth arguing because you know if, if I actually need to give you an argument to convince you of this. Mm-hmm. Probably yeah. nothing I can tell you is going to convince yeah. you. Of it, so. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, so, I mean, that's a, probably a good, uh, uh, a good way to uh, see. Uh, that's a good segue into your um, your your talk at uh, UT. Uh, so there was a. Uh, so you talked about your favorite, you know, your favorite topic of late epidemiologists and epidemiology, and you know, we've 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 gone over, um, we've talked about this uh, before, and you know, people have seen uh, your work. Um, you know, there were, uh, you know, I think um, w- one of the things, you know, me and you were talking about earlier is do they, you know, like, you know, is there something going on with the epidemiologists that is sort of like sort of what's happening with the masks where there's a kind of preference, you know, falsification or just sort of conformity uh, to a dominant worldview? Uh, I guess what I'm asking is, you know, how have how have, you know, people in the field reacted to your work both publicly and, and privately? Yes, yeah, so that's that's interesting. Like um, I've had very different sorts of reactions. So you know, I, I tend to think that there are, you know, with respect to this question, I'd say there are like I, I put epidemiologists in three categories. So you have an epidemiologist. It's a very broad, you know, thing. You know, epidemiology is a very broad field. You have epidemiologists working on like very different things. So you yeah, have, so you'll have like statisticians. You'll have economists, right? You'll have people yeah, who are and, actually professors and, of epidemiology. And, yeah. Yeah, and also you know. Uh, most of them don't work on, don't specialize on epidemic modeling. Mm. You know, like a lot of epidemiologists are going to do studies, for instance, on how, you know, what factors uh, increase your risk of, say, uh, you know, uh, certain types of cancer. You know, like, so that's, you know, they do so the studies. Like, so when someone has an epidemiological model, they might be a doctor who knows nothing about or very little about math or stats, or they might be a math and stats person who knows about modeling, uh, but doesn't know basics of uh, like how diseases spread and things like that. Is, is that right? Like often you will have these, you know, people yeah, coming think, at it from completely different places. Yeah, I think most most epidemiologists, I'd say, are people who are going to be doing those like huge regressions where, uh, you know, they have those survey data of people about you know what type of uh, do certain behaviors, what what kind of things they eat, etc. And like, and they throw the kitchen sink. You know, they do those regressions where they put all those stuff. Yeah, and yeah. you know, it's, pl- it's plagued by measurement error. So those those studies are pretty worthless in my opinion most of the time. And then you're going to conclude that you know that's how you get those headlines that say yeah, and confounding uh, variables and all kinds of. I mean, are those, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, the kind of people who do the is that those are like the are they like the same as the nutrition people who will say oh people who eat apples you know live five years longer yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's, apples it's, it's, it's cause you. Yeah, yeah, it's the same people. It's the same people, uh-huh. and but those guys don't specialize on epidemic modeling. And so, you know, like I said, you know, I think there are like my experience, you know, during the pandemic with like my interactions with them, uh, both publicly and privately. I'd say there are like about like three. I'd, I'd say there are three categories. You know, to answer your question, I'd, I'd say you know, you know, there are three categories of epidemiologists. You have um, some of them um, who like buy all the things that they, you know, that those studies they push. Not necessarily them, but you know, other people are publishing. Uh, you know, other people who do specialize in uh, epidemic modeling are publishing and pushing some that are that are really bad. You know, so that's a, some of what well, one thing I did in the talk, and I I went over some of the main examples. I think you know, uh, representative examples of really bad things they've done. You know, uh, methodologically ridiculous things that they've done. And uh, but you know. You have some people who don't, so you know those studies are written by people who do typically specialize in epidemic modeling, but then they get they get pedal, you know they get pushed by people who don't, other epidemiologists who don't, and I think very often those people genuinely believe the conclusions of those studies, and they genuinely believe that those studies have um, firmly established those conclusions. Like they're not they're not pretending, you know, it's not a case of preference falsification. To to go back to uh, your question, uh, but those are people who are like. Uh, they don't know this stuff very well. Like they, again, they, they're epidemiologists, but like I said, it's a very broad category, and those guys don't specialize in epidemic modeling, so they don't even really know, in my opinion, how you know in most cases how the studies work and how they claim, you know, they how they derive the conclusions that they're uh, pushing. Uh, some of them, I think, to be honest, are pretty stupid. Like I mean, I've had conversations that were surreal with some of them. Like there is this uh, French epidemiologist. 
yeah. who, uh, who actually has received a, a prize, you know, the, the most prestigious, she, she works at the INSERM, which is the most prestigious uh, French public health research institution. And she got in 2020, she got the most prestigious prize of this institution. And I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, I was having some, you know, like debates with her on Twitter. And, and at first I could not believe, you know, that I, I was assuming, no, she was saying something that sounded so stupid. Well, well that, since this is a public debate, what's the woman's name? Uh, Dominique Costagliola. Costagliola. How do you spell that yeah. for our audience who wants to look her up? C-O-S-T-I-J-L-I-O-L-A. Okay. Uh, and and um, she, well, yeah, she was saying something that was so stupid. I, I was assuming, I remember the first time I had an interaction with her and she said something that sounded like, that she, she, it sounded like she was completely missing the point. And because all I knew, you know, was, I was very naive at the time, you know, I, I didn't realize how bad so many of those people were. Mm. And so I was just assuming, you know, no, okay, she must be getting at something else that I don't get. Mm. You know, she's not saying what she seems to be saying. Mm. And, but then I started talking with her and I realized, no, she really was, you know, she really was totally missing the point. Mm. So you have a lot of those people. Well, what's can, the, be, can you, do you remember what you, what, what this was? I don't remember what the detail was. It was, um, I don't know if that was her, but I can, no, that wasn't with another. So I don't remember what this discussion with her was about. I remember that around the same time I had a discussion with like another French biostatistician. So the guy is actually a biostatistician. That's his, you know, he does that professionally. And I was talking about how, um, you know, in the certain studies, in certain studies, there was a, a lot of measurement error, you know, because basically uh, to, to count people as positive, like they didn't have PCR tests because they, mm. you know, there was a shortage at the time. So they were looking at symptoms. So, you know, it means that you have a lot of uh, measurement error. But, you know, um, among other things, when you have a lot of measurement error, it, it reduces statistical power. Mm. So it's, it becomes harder to detect effects that are even when they're present. Yeah. So if you ask and, people, and just, uh, have you had COVID? And like, you know, 80% of the time there. So it's hard to get statistical significance, even when you have good measures sometimes. Um, yeah. But then when like, uh, it's like 70% of the time, like only 7% of the time your data is even right. Um, yeah, and, uh, and so I was making, you know, this is a really basic point that you learn when you take an introduction to statistics. You're probably going to learn this about measurement error, that it has this consequence. And this guy was a professional biostatistician. He, again, he's paid, he does that for a living, he's paid to do this. And he was, he, he, like, he was denying this. He was telling me that I was making stuff up, you know. And I, I just, and he was, you know, I thought at first that he was like arguing in bad faith, but then like, I've had several interactions with him. And no, it's clear that, you know, so there are people who get paid to do this stuff and don't know even the most basic stuff. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there it was something, in her case, it was something even more ridiculous. I mean, I remember that later I had this other interaction with her, like in, she was insisting that um, uh, the epidemic, you know, in early 2021 was, um, was growing exponentially, you know, because that's what your uh, basic model predicts at the beginning of a, of yeah. an epidemic, when you looked at the data, you know, it was very clear that it wasn't. But of course, you know, um, what, what they were doing, basically, like they were feeding model, exponential model, and, you know, uh, you feed it at the beginning of the wave, you know, and it tells you that it, it's growing, you know, the model uh, assumes that there is exponential growth. So, of course, when you know, feed the data to it, yeah. you know, it's going to fit, it's going to get the best fit you can based yeah. on this assumption. But the rate of growth, if you feed it at the beginning of the wave, you're going to get a certain rate of growth that's supposed to be constant because it's exponential. That's mm. a model, what the model assumes anymore. And then they're going to, you feed it like a month later. But of course, because the rate of growth is not actually constant, you know, it's going to, when it fits it, when you feed it to the data, like a month later, you get another rate of growth. But you know, if you, in, you can still fit the model to the data. So she was insisting that uh, it was growing exponentially, mm. even though clearly it wasn't, you know, because it just in our argument was basically that, oh, you can fit an exponential model to the data. Well, of course you can, you can fit, you know, you know, as long as you don't care about how good the fit is. No. Nah. How helpful the model is going to be. <laughs> it anybody will do anything, you know. Like so, it was something. You know, I had some surreal conversations. So, you know, going back, you know, to your question. So, you have like those people who, you know, they're like epidemiologists or statisticians, but don't specialize in epidemiology. modeling. And honestly, they're yeah. just like pretty stupid people, to be honest. And yeah. and and they really believe, you know. Well, maybe they're not stupid. stupid. Maybe they ins they could if they fi if they spent if they cared about getting to the truth, they could figure it out. The incentive I mean, structure in academia rewards 
sh- the ability to put it uh, to put a bunch of numbers in a computer and then spit out a regression and then come back and then you know t- uh, just defend uh, it like is that like an attorney? Guys, those guys were not the producers of those studies; they were consumers of those studies, and then they were pushing them, but they were not the one you know uh, uh, writing those studies. So okay. in in their case, I really don't think so. You know, I'm, I'm like. I no, know it's, it's, it's the same. It's the same question because they're academics and they're yeah they they, they have the same incentive. The same incentive is to do, not to, to dig into the details. The incentive is to just uh, uh, take it and uh, take it at face value and, and run with it, right? Yeah, but you know, you know, like um, you you talking with them. Of course, you know, you don't. You're not. I'm not in their head. I don't know to what extent you know. But talking with them, it's it became like it's becoming like really hard for me to believe that you know that they actually could you know. Uh, mm. understand that stuff. Like, <clears throat> sorry. So uh, I mean, I I think I I don't know. Like I I didn't talk to these specific people, but you know, when you look at sometimes you look at academics uh, uh, records, and there were some of the ones you've you've you know you've uh, whose work you've taken apart. You look at their publications. You know, they have like fifteen a year, right? They have fifteen papers a year, yeah. and the mental energy they must put into each paper must be minimal. This is what the rewards: fancy models. Uh, unqu- you know, don't ask too many tough questions about the data. Publish 15, 20, 30, you know, uh, thirty papers, forty papers, whatever a year. Some of them are ridiculous. They're like one out of like you know fifty authors on like you know five page paper, right? Um, and you know, so you don't know how much mental energy they've ever put into this. It, it could be the bare minimum. That's the incentive. The incentive is the as much paper as possible. Make it plausible on its surface. If you, for someone who doesn't dig too deeply, and then the minimum maximize uh, output amount of paper. You know, that's good enough to get into the journals and minimize the mental energy spent on each one. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but again, like those guys I'm talking about, they they were not the producers of those. No, papers. they don't have to be producers. It's the same thing. It's the same thing with uh, uh, influence. What are they? Yeah, like something between <clears> academics <throat> and influencers. They're you know, it, it's just uh, take it, run with it, go find the next study, you know, run with it, whatever. It's a, it's it's the same thing. It's just it's just yeah, like I, you, I mean, you have to. Yeah, you know, the, the incentives here are so bad you can't even tell who's stupid. But, but you know, I do see a difference between those people and other people I've interacted with. Like those okay. people, I was very often I was arguing with them and it was clear that they didn't even get the argument uh-huh. and the problem was not you know that they were coming up with like um i don't know like ridiculous um yeah you know, okay well i mean enough enough of how stupid they are that's a, yeah, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. the first thing uh, yeah. i think you're working so, for the first category I, I, is people I, who are stupid I, I think you know i definitely think that there are some of them who just genuinely don't understand it and i really as weird as it may sound you know really can't understand but then you have like another category who tend to be people who like do specialize in epidemic modeling. And those guys, I think, tend to be smarter. Mm. Uh, they tend to know a lot more statistics and to just like just be smart in general, uh, which probably not is not unrelated with the knowing more statistics. Um, and, um, and those people, uh, I think it's different here. Here they have some faint understanding of the limitations of the method they're using. And mm. in their case, I have no doubt that if they thought harder about it, they would see that um, those limitations are much more, the extent to which those uh, issues with the methods um, undermine the conclusion is much more serious than what they make it sound when they write the paper. So, you know, when you write the paper, when the scientists write a paper, they go through what I call a script. You know, what you learn when you go to grad school to become a scientist, one of the things you learn, the main thing you learn, you learn a bunch of scripts what I call scripts. And basically, when you write a paper, you have to follow a certain script. What you learn in, dra- in grad school, and you get to, you know, you learn a few scripts. And then you learn to, f- to write papers by following those scripts. And as long as you follow the script, so the script is going to be, you know, a certain structure. You start from like, describing the data. You, know, you have a limitation. Yeah. You do a literature review. You, you know, for we have in political science. So it's like <clears throat> you do a literature review. You make it seem important. Um, you cite a lot of papers. Then you have the, you get a bunch of data. No one is going to ask too too hard questions about the quality of the data. Like you could have like, oh, you want to monitor corruption in different countries. You know, some survey. Don't don't ask, you, you know that's just one of your you know maybe you have ten variables and that's just one of your ten variables and you don't ask any questions. You just take whatever face value. Maybe they ask. Maybe they do a survey of corruption. Maybe it's just a guess of some expert. You put it into a regression. Uh, you know you get you get uh, uh, some uh, data, some p values. Uh, you say I'm going to do a robustness test, <laughs> yeah. which involves like you know uh, like I don't know dropping one variable or adding 
adding one variable or transforming the data. And it's like, it doesn't solve the problem because it's like, you know, the data sucks. It's all garbage. And it's like, it's biased in a certain direction. And it's like going to be very robust often. Um, and that doesn't matter. And then like, you know, conclusion, say more research is needed to say, you know, X, Y, Z. And then you can, you can, you can get in a, like a, a publication at APSR. Yeah, this is the, exactly, exactly what you're saying. It, it's a little different there for each field, but it's pretty, that's pretty yeah. much what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. And you so you have, you know, you learn a part of the script, of course, a certain method. So, you know, if you're an epidemiologist of infectious diseases, you learn that, you know, uh, you can feed the data to a serotype model. And, you know, you know, you can, you know, you get some degree of freedom in how you uh, tweak the model. But, you know, the basic structure is always the same. And as long as you follow the script, you'll be fine. Yeah. But nobody's really asking, you know, really thinking hard about to what extent following the script is actually truth conducive. Yeah. And very often it isn't. But those people who read the limitation section, of course, you know, most of the times they're going to raise most of the issues, but they're not going to, you know, they're going to raise them only very superficially, and and uh, they're going to make it sound as if it wasn't, it weren't like as serious a yeah. problem as it actually is. And so those guys, I'm pretty sure that those guys, most of the times, they're smart enough and knowledgeable enough, uh, so that. If they really thought hard about those issues, they would realize the extent to which they actually undermine their conclusions, which is a much greater extent than what they make it sound in the, say, the limitation section of the paper. Yeah. But they don't because, you know, the, the, the incentives are not, they're, they're not incentivized to do this. They're incentivized to do the opposite because if you start doing this, you know, they're going to publish less paper. Uh, it's going to actually get be harder to get it published because um, if your conclusion seems more shaky, and that's what it would seem like if you were more honest in like discussing the uh, limitations, you know, the shortcoming of the methods you're using. Of course, you know, it's going to make it harder to to get published. So you know, yeah. they don't have the right incentives. But um, you know, often they even raise again superficially the main issues. They just don't, you know, uh, go very deep because again, you know, the incentives are against doing this. Uh, mm. But those guys, you know, I have no doubt that in the vast majority of cases. Uh, if they really felt hard about this. And, you know, like I said, they, they already know it at some level, but usually yeah. it's very superficial. But my point is, like, if they really thought hard about this, they would realize to what extent it's really, it seriously undermines their conclusions. And so, but nevertheless, they don't. You know, they don't because uh, they're not incentivized to do this. Um, and, you know, they go, it becomes, you know, it becomes kind of automatic. You learn those scripts and, you, became, you become convinced that, you know, as long as you follow the script, you've yeah. done your job as a scientist, you know, because really, in, in a way, you know, you have, you know. Well, that's, you, know, that's often, you know, often, though, it's funny because often, like, you can make a career just debunking other people's stuff. And, like, you can even, you can do that. And, like, and you could publish a paper on, like, how all these other studies were nonsense. But the thing is, even if you do that, like, Andrew Gellman is, you know, somebody who's in, uh, who's in, you know, who's in uh, uh, academia. And he's a statistician and he can write papers and everyone can cite his papers and they, you know, they can be very self-critical, but then someone will go back and just keep doing the same thing often. And then, uh, you know, they'll be peer reviewed by the people who've been doing the same thing. And it just will exist in, you know, parallel, parallel worlds, right? There's, there's yeah. a norm in academia. And this is why being on Twitter is like, and being a little bit rude on Twitter, I think is be beneficial because there is no, there's no mechanism in academia to say, these people are like they've been their methods have been refuted like as actually good we've pointed out the flaws they have no answer to them and therefore like we should stop presenting this as, as science right there's no mechanism for that there's journals that will keep publishing the same things uh peer reviewed by the same people and you know the critiques they, there's a little bit of this like things are better in like psychology since the replication crisis you can't just have any p hacked anything and like send it to the best journals like it does get a little better but not nearly <clears throat> Uh, not nearly a, enough once the critiques do come from within the academy. Yes, no, I, I agree. But, you know, uh, at least, you know, many of those people, like I was saying, you know, they, you know, they, they have some faith understanding of the problems and if, and they have the ability uh, to actually understand much more, you know, again, the extent to which those problems are serious. If they, if they really thought harder about it, but they don't because, yeah. you know, again, they're not. That's, yeah, that's, that's the second category. What's the third category? The third category is people who do are more, you know, at, for whatever reason, you know, maybe they're, uh, maybe they care more about, you know, it could be like a, for, a form of like political ideological bias, but you know, that results in good consequences. So, you know, yeah. say if you, 
if you're really biased in favor of uh, individual freedom, you're going to have some kind of a, a stronger incentive to uh, think harder about the methodological shortcomings of studies that, uh, you know, that can be used to argue in favor of restricting those freedoms, for instance. Yeah. In a way, this is a form so of... They're, con of they're just conservatives, and because they're conservatives and they dislike the liberal scientists or whatever, uh, they end up being correct. Or they're libertarian. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're going to be incentivized to think harder about those questions, and, you know, they're going to be... Their bias is going to make them right, you know. So this, yeah. this, this is the thing, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, priors, having priors, you know, everybody has priors, and he doesn't... Uh, you can have good consequences. You know, you, there's this yeah. naive view of science that you, the way to do science is that you should start from a blank state. But nobody, you can't, you literally cannot do this. Like mm -hmm. you always have to make some, you know, you need a model. And what is it? What is a model? You need to make some assumptions about what the world is like. That's right. the only way you can study anything. So, uh, and um, so, you know, there are some cases. So, so for whatever reason, it can be this reason. Uh, it can also be because those are people who are like more um, just, uh, by character, they're like more uh, interested in those methodological issues. So there are people who are like are more inclined to think about methodological issues, but because they they like to think more about this, they're going to be thinking harder about those shortcomings, and they're going to realize the extent to which they undermine the conclusion of all those studies. Mm. So in that case, you know, it's not really it's not really an ideological bias that that lead them to uh, do realize you feel, that. Do you feel like it's hard, so hard to measure? You know, you've, you've your attention. Your stuff has gotten a lot of attention. You've, you know, lec you're lecturing at a at a how do you say science, uh, science, science school, school. yeah, uh, at, in France, school. which is a very prestigious uh, prestigious school in France. Um, you are, you know, you've been cited in, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, the New Yorker or New York Magazine. You've been cited in, the, you've been uh, you published in the in the French newspapers and the Figaro, uh, Wall Street Journal. You've been talking about this stuff. Um, it's hard to measure, but do you think that you know either you or collectively people making critiques of this model is, is the is the conversation here smarter than it was in say early twenty twenty? Um, wait, can you go back on the the end of your question? I didn't quite get it. What is the? Um, do you think that it's, uh things have gotten uh, smarter since early oh, 2020? Oh. The public conversation. Yeah, no, about I, I think you know. I mean, not nearly as much as I would have liked, but I would say that definitely there are more people, including like you know journalists. I'm not just talking about you know, of course scientists, but also journalists who are aware that some of the things we believed in 2020 are like, that it's actually much more complicated than what we thought yeah. we believed in 2020 at the beginning of this thing. Uh, yeah, I would say this. Of course, not nearly as much as I would as I would like. You know, like just a few, uh, like two weeks ago, there was this paper that was published uh, by this group of epidemiologists in the UK arguing that, um, you know, uh, had the, the lockdown been declared, uh, been implemented one or two weeks earlier in the UK, it would have saved, you know, certain like thousands of lives. They give a precise number, you know, yeah. and, um, and, and, you know, but that paper is ridiculous and it's kind of extraordinary. So that's what I mean when I say not as much as I would have, as I would like, you know, because I think it's quite extraordinary that uh, two years into the pandemic, you can still publish this kind of paper. And of course, this paper made all of the headlines in the UK, you know, and, and, and still be taken seriously. Like I've had, you know, I've, Basically, what this paper is doing is that it's a sophisticated version of this. You know, you take the uh, the observed reduction of epidemic growth after they implemented the lockdown in the actual world in the UK, and then what you do to do your counterfactual analysis, you assume that had the lockdown been implemented one or two weeks earlier, <laughs> you would have seen the same reduction in epidemic growth, but just one or two weeks earlier. Yeah. So of course, you're going to find that you know yeah. um, it, it would have saved like thousands of people. But, you know, you have to make a lot of totally implausible assumption to, you know, to assume that this methodology is going to give you... But it it uh, saved people, but you're, you're just pushing the... Uh, so I guess uh, at some point, you avoid the wave at the end. It doesn't, it doesn't end up being up because you get the vaccines eventually, I guess. Something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, there's, of course, there is also this issue, you know. But even if you set aside this issue that, you know, you're just delaying the inevitable in a way, if you, you yeah. know, until, you know, the vaccine yeah. arrives. So, uh, but, you know, it's not even the issue. Like, the issue is just that... Um, in order to do this, you have to assume, for instance, that, um, you know, suppose that in fact, as I think is the case, um, like uh, a big factor in um, like um, lowering, you know, or reducing uh, epidemic growth uh, was people voluntarily changing their behavior, uh, reducing contact. And so, you know, and uh, 
And uh, of course, you know, the we're not in China, you know, so you, you know, if you declare a lockdown um, and people, you know, reduce change their behavior because of this, uh, it's only going to work to the extent that people are complying, for instance. And it's not that obvious that if you declare the, that's just one example, there are many other possibilities, you know, that, to, that, that could make this, that, this methodology wrong. But mm. um, <clears throat> if you had declared the lockdown two weeks earlier, when there was like literally virtually no death from COVID-19 in the UK, it's not at all obvious that people would have reacted to the lockdown yeah, yeah. the same way. And in particular, uh, that so this is just an example. This is an example. We would know this is yeah. We, we, people can see your work and why this why this stuff is is not very reliable. Sure. But the, yeah, the question is, is there, there's less of it, right? And so I think there's yeah. there's there, but there is yeah there is less of it, but the, there is less of it. I mean, I agree. You know, there are, at least there are going to be more people, even in even journalists, who are going to you know, object to this kind of stuff, like point out that, okay, you know, the, yeah. maybe we shouldn't take those results at face value. There's it's definitely more, yeah. you know, there's yeah, definitely the more marketplace of, of ideas. I mean, it does almost, it's, it's sort of, it, it works as, you know, in the long run, it seems, there seems to be some corrective mechanisms. So Scott Alexander was uh, talking about, um, uh, psychology. Uh, so people reporting on psychology, like we just we talked about earlier, used to be any p hacked any research you could publish in a journal. Journalists would run with it, right? Now you do that. Uh, you know, it's like a cliche thing to say. Oh, will it replicate? Oh, p hacking. This stuff has almost been cliche. So even people on Twitter, like even like not not smart people now, will like <clears> you know it just become the thing to say. Like okay, this 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 result might not be you know very reliable. Um, we're going through something now where like there's people keep posting like charts about like the decline of democracy, you know, which I enjoy mocking on Twitter. And I think we're going to have to have a reckoning about that at some point. Now people are still posting it and, you know, here's <laughs> Trump comes into it's like democracy. You know, it's just, this is the stupidest of yeah. all. It's like hilarious that this even like, it's like more ridiculous than epidemiology, more ridiculous than the, uh, uh, the psychology stuff. But, you know, eventually you know, I, I'm helping mock this. I think I'm speeding the day along when this stuff is, you know, no longer uh, taken seriously by by anyone. Um, but it's 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 slow. I mean, you know, like uh, you know, like, I agree, and uh, to some extent, it's 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 better now. You know, if you're, if you're talking about the pandemic, uh, it's better now than it was in 2020. But it's still pretty bad, you know, because at the end of the day, this study I was just talking about is still the case that it made all the headlines. Yeah. And it was still, you know, so some, there were more, for sure there were more people who were like protesting against it, you know, raising objections, pointing out that uh, the conclusion was, was not really warranted. So there yeah. was more of that in 2020. But, you know, those people, even today, you know, at the end of the day, they're still drawn out into the, 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 the noise made by the people who are actually peddling the study in question. You know? Yeah. Uh, so I'm not saying it's not better, but, you know, it's still like we're, we're not nowhere near a point where, where you know, I would like us to be, and, and you know, you're you're mentioning those stuff with like democracy, you know, scales, you know, how it goes. Mm -hmm. it just, yeah, it was just this like uh, data journalist from the the Economist who just like published this thing on Twitter, yeah, you know, yeah. objecting to uh, must um, little like uh, mem, you know, that he published, um, you know, that that basically showed that um, you know was saying, you know, that like people well, on the left, people, like, the left has gotten more left. Yeah. Over yeah the radicalized left. while yeah. the people on the right more or less stayed at the same place. You know, and this guy was like, Oh no, I have data, you know, that shows that the, exactly the opposite is, is has yeah. happening. You know, it's one of those, you know, look, of course it's data don't actually show this, you know, but uh, what's really funny about the whole thing is that, look, if your data are telling you something that anyone with like a, a hint of common sense can yeah. see is complete nonsense, the right thing to do is like to be, oh, there's probably something wrong with my data. And you shouldn't be like, but you know, people still do this stuff, even though there has been criticism of those uh, scales. You know, in the you know, people have been pointing on that stuff already in the past, but yeah. it doesn't really matter. You know, like yeah, are, we've lived, we've lived through the last ten. 15 years. I mean, you talk about good data. I mean, Zach Goldberg's stuff on the Great Awakening, just the words that they use. I mean, the, the vocabulary is not even the same as it was 10 years ago. And the ideas that were ridiculous are now, you know, commonplace or forced on people about sexuality and race. So, yes, yes, exactly. Like, if you can't see, you know, we've gotten yeah. more uh, left wing in the last. And it's so, it's, they so easily, it's so easily switch from between, you know, uh, it's not happening. Oh, it's, you know, it's a cliche on Twitter now. Oh, it's not happening to, uh, you know, it's good if it's happening, right? It's like, if, as soon as you play, prove it's happening, yeah, yeah. you'll say, you know, it's good. It, it, it's, it's some kind of uh, advancement. So yeah, you're right. It, it's slow. I remember though, in early, in uh, early 2020, when people uh, <coughs> talked about the curves, like uh, flattening the curve, you know, people treated these like models, like gospel. They treated it like it was, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, you know, uh, like theory of relativity or something like something you could measure just completely, yeah. you know, perfectly. And then that's, and that's gone. I mean, the, you know, the, uh, these, you know, the, they've lost a lot of credi credibility here. Um, yeah. So, you know, that's, that's all interesting. Um, you know, how do you like, let's talk a little bit about sort of influencing <laughs> public opinion on these things. Cause something CSBI is interested in something Salem center is interested in is not just like publishing papers or academic journals and <clears throat> trying to talk to, you know, other people who are specialists in one field or another. Uh, it's about, you know, focusing on ideas that are important that matter for the world and, you know, it's spreading is uh, spreading uh, what's true and what's not, uh, you know, to, to as um, much people as possible to try to influence ultimately uh, politics and policy. Um, you know, so the uh, so you have had success here in that you've never taken a class in epidemiology. Uh, you're now a lecturer in epidemiology at a prestigious <coughs> French university. Um, how how does this happen? And you know, what, what are your thoughts on sort of that that process of how we got here? I mean, um, I think that um, there. Are, so you know, I mentioned like those talked about those two categories of people who are epidemiologists and how they. Uh, reacted to that stuff, but you know there are, there are some too. So that's one thing. That's one aspect is that you also have some specialists who, for instance, read my stuff and just just agreed with it and thought you know they, they thought it was correct. Yeah. And they would like reach out to me and they would share it with other people. So you know that's that's I think that's one way in which and you know also sometimes they would share it also in public. So it helps you know. So one way in which you know um, one thing that helps, of course, ultimately you want for, you want in particular journalists. To raise those issues that I'm raising, for instance, mm. because you know, ultimately, if you want to, if you want to, you know, influence uh, uh, ordinary people or you know, decision makers, the ones who do it ultimately, it's the media. So you, mm. you need journalists who are going to talk about the, the issues you're raising. And one thing that helps a lot with this, uh, you know, credentials still matter a lot. So you can do even when you don't have the right credentials, you know, you can to some extent get some influence, which you know, I think I've, I've been able to do to again to a small extent, but still not not zero extent. Um, but, uh, one thing that helps a lot about this is when people who do have the right credentials, uh, will share your stuff and say, you know, and like praise it or say, you know, that it's, this is actually, yeah. this is actually serious work because then journalists, well, of course it's not, the, it's not their fault. You know, in that case, I'm not even blaming journalists. Like they're not, you know, it's not their job and they don't have the right, like, um, um, tools, you know, to, to do this themselves. Like they need, but you know, they need to get someone whose credentials to tell them when who you can take seriously or not, and so when you have people who like, and it takes some courage, you know, going against your field sometimes, you know, mm. uh, who um, actually, you know, even sometimes some important people in your field too. So it's not just a question, you know, it's like, it can be bad for your career, you know. Uh, but you know, we're going to like share something like the stuff I've been reading, writing, and uh, and say, oh, this is really good stuff, you know, and uh, you know, I agree with it, or if this is something you know important that people should spend more time thinking about um, this, you know, journalists are going to see that and, um, and they're going to be, uh, um, be like, okay, so when this guy is saying something, uh, I should not just ignore him just because he's not properly credentialed. So right. that's one thing that helps. That's one thing that helps. So, you know, you still need some people who from within are going to be like um, willing to um, endorse stuff that's critical of the mainstream in their field. And uh, even written by people who are not, who, who come from the outside, you know. And so in my experience, this definitely helps, you know. Like, um, there are lots of people, because people who are, you know, I was talking about those epidemiologists that I was like, who were like, missing some of the points I was making. But you also had many of them who didn't, you know, that I got, I received quite a few emails from people, from people in the field, you know, who were telling me that they agreed with me. So, you know, people who, who are, you know, do have the, the background knowledge you need to understand that stuff, um, they, they, you know, obviously they, they don't need, you know, they, they don't care that I'm not properly credentialed because they can judge for themselves whether what I'm writing is nonsense or not. Mm. And so those people, um, and some of those people would like, again, you know, um, uh, share it in public or praise it in public. And of course it's helped because then journalists would see this and were like, okay, I can take this. So, this, so the, ultimately, I mean, the, the path is, you know, you can have credentials, or if you don't, you just do good work, and then it has to get someone's attention, basically. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. there is that—that's hopeful. That's a hopeful story because there's gatekeepers, of course. But 
you could you could you could come from really nothing. I mean, you you are nothing as far as epidemiology credibility. You have a PhD, you know, your PhD student at Cornell in philosophy. People see that they say that you know that's that's smart. That takes some that takes some brains. Um, but you're nowhere. At least you're nowhere near near the field um, of you know what people consider expertise here. So <coughs> there's you know I guess there's I guess the lesson is there's sort of a, there is room for lateral movement between uh, like fields, like you're, you know, you have some credentials as a smart person, you can't talk about another field. Now, I guess an interesting question is if you were just, if you were like a truck driver um, and you wrote yeah. the exact same things, would people have, share, <laughs> people have shared it? I guess yeah, it's a silly I mean, question, I, but it's a different, it's a different kind of, uh, no, no. It's, a, it's a, it is a, it is a, I think it's just, it's not a silly question. I think it's actually a good question. So no, no, it's, I, I don't think it's a silly question at all. I definitely think that it helps, you know, being a PhD student, uh, what, one thing it's going to do is that people are going to give it a try at least. Yeah. Like if you're a PhD student in philosophy, if you're a PhD student in interpretive dance, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe better yeah, off yeah, being yeah. a truck driver probably. Yeah. But you know, having so it could be something else. You know, if I were like a, uh, an economist, you know, similarly, I would not be a specialist in yeah. uh, epidemic modeling, but people would at least give it a shot. Yeah. At least they're, they're more likely to give it a shot because if you okay, this person um, is likely kind of smart. So I can at least, you know, maybe what he's writing is nonsense, but it may be worth reading it. You know, there is a chance that yeah. it's not nonsense. Or the people who a- want to believe what you're saying will give it a chance. Yeah. Yeah. And there yeah. are gonna be, there's always going to be smart people who want to believe it, and the people, smart people who don't want to believe it will, won't give it a chance. But the influential people who do will look at it, and then I can get out. Yeah, there. I mean, you know, even even some people who don't want to believe it yeah. may give it a shot. May. Of course, it's much, more, it's much less likely than yeah. people who do want to believe it, obviously. But, so in that sense, it matters. Um, but and of course, you know, if I were a truck driver, um, I could have written exactly the same thing. I would have had a yeah, I would have had a much harder time getting people to give it a shot. You know, and but you know, I think that I don't even think it's entirely impossible. Of course, it's much harder. But once some people, enough people, have given it a shot, then I think I, I could still have gotten to the same point. It's just that you know, um, in practice, I wouldn't have gotten to the same point because yeah, that's the bottom. Uh, that's yeah. the bottom line. And if it does get attention and you're a truck driver, I think it would be even cooler because if, if, if yeah. everyone would say, oh my God, a truck, there's a, there's a truck driver genius who refuted epidemiology. There was a, there was a guy who had like, there was a guy who used to show up in the media in the U S he had like the highest measured IQ or something. That's like, it was like 200 or something. And he was like a bouncer in some bar in Wyoming. And you know, you could find like the ABC, like news stories on this guy. He's like a bouncer in Wyoming. And he's, uh, he's, <laughs> he's working on like some physics theory of theory of everything. Uh, you know, he's, he's been online and had a little bit of a presence but yeah just just you know a bouncer in wyoming which was which made it notable a high IQ, yeah, no, like it, a, a major it, makes for a, it makes for a much better story you know if you if you really are a truck driver but of course it's also uh before you can get to the point where it, it has become a story it's much harder you know because you need to it's going to be much harder to get people to give it a shot yeah yeah so, so it, but, it, yeah exactly so but people you know there are there are smart you know it's one thing you know it's actually a good way of like uh, separating, you know, it, it's rational to some extent. It Look, is, people it have is. Lim- You're right. people have people have only limited a limited amount of time. Like when reading stuff, it has an opportunity cost. When you're reading some stuff by a truck driver, you're not reading some other stuff by a more properly credentialed person. So you know that statistically, uh, the stuff written by, say, an economist or even like a fluffy PhD student, although you know people have a um, you know, I can tell you from experience that uh, people don't start from the assumption that a, a, f- a philosopher is like competent to talk about those matters because really? you, you've looked. You, I'm sure you've seen the GRE scores where the philosophers are uh, the <coughs> students are at the top, right? Yeah, but most people don't know that, uh-huh. and also most people have like this um, um, very um, distorted view of what fo- you know. At least the kind of philosophy that I do is like. So they assume that, for instance, if you're a philosopher, you're mostly a like a um, literary kind of person. So you're not like, yeah. they don't think that a philosopher is going to be uh, competent to talk about like quantitative stuff you know, right. like, and right. then stuff like statistics. But actually you know, a lot of philosophers are because, you know, they do, uh, they do work on like pretty technical stuff, but people yeah. don't know this, you know, that's not the, that's not the popular image of philosophy, but still it's, it's much, it's a much better position to start in than being a truck driver. And as I was saying, you know, it's rational to some extent. I mean, look, statistically a philosopher is less likely to write uh, stuff that's um, interesting and, and uh, correct about that stuff, you know, uh, and and a truck driver is even less um, likely to to do so. So you have limited amount of time. Yeah, uh, elitism, is, elitism is rational to some degree. You, you take yeah, somebody yeah. from a high 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 uh, 
quality school. You know what? You know you know you could overrate it or you could underrate it, but it, unquestionably, uh, giving credentials some uh, at least, if not credentials, like I, I don't think special. I would not give specialization anything. Um, you know, if you took gave me somebody talking outside their field, a physics PhD at Caltech, talking about uh, education, right? I would take that over the most credential, you know, education world because I know that person has IQ. So I think it makes. I think it's rational actually for uh, intelligence um, to, to, to to judge people's intelligence, but, but less so for specialization to take someone more. Yeah, seriously. I mean, but. but- yeah, but even for specialization, it has some. It is. It has something. You know, You're right. It has yeah, something. It, yeah, it, it does say. It. it does say something. And, and you know that's. But that's also why it helps so much when someone who is properly credentialed, um, you know, publicly says that your work is like worth taking seriously, because then you change the the calculus for other people. Change. They're like suddenly, you know, they're like they go from oh, this guy's a truck driver. It's very likely that this stuff he's saying is pure nonsense, and I'm gonna. It's gonna be a waste of my time. My time would be better used like reading something else. It goes from this to, you know, suddenly there's like this big prominent say, statistician who say, oh, this is serious stuff. Like it's a, you, you should read it. Uh, then, you know, the fact that the guy is a truck driver becomes much less relevant all of a sudden. So that's why, you know, it goes back to what I was saying before. It's very important when people who are properly credentials are, you know, you know, some work, uh, you know, some of them, enough of them have to sometimes give it a shot. As I was saying, you know, give a, sh- a chance to people from the outside uh, and, um, and then be willing if the stuff is actually worthwhile, is actually like good enough, uh, be willing to go public and say praise it in public or share it in public. Yeah, uh, I think this goes a long way. You know, um, I think another factor, another thing that helped is when um, is when you know you you make some correct predictions and the people who are specialists don't. And you know, mm-hmm. of course, if it happens just once, then that could be a fluke. It doesn't really mean anything if it happens twice, say. But if it happens repeatedly, you know, and and during the pandemic, you know, I mean, of course, I got something wrong. Like everybody got stuff wrong, including myself, you know. But um, those guys, you know, um, some of those epidemiologists were like initially taking their seriously. You know, as you said, at first, like people were treating the output of those models as like gospel. And um, but you know, after a while, you know, they kept like making predictions that just like uh, were wrong, you know. And and um, and you know, and for instance, I I wasn't about at least some of that stuff and so people you know some people at least noticed that and it made them more likely as i was saying to give it a shot they were like okay sure this guy is not a specialist but since uh, he's repeatedly gotten this yeah. stuff right that the uh, specialist well, 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 maybe it's I, worth reading you know maybe there's yeah. a maybe there's a good reason for that maybe it's not just a chance you know and I, what you're getting at here too, and yeah, that's all, you know, we're having sort of two discussions about the, the epistemology, like how, who you should trust and why and what's rational and what's not. We're also having the uh, sort of a PR thing and like, you know, giving, uh, uh, you know, practical sort of advice or practical thinking about how to, um, you know, how to get more, more attention here. Um, and, you know, the thing, you, yeah, you mentioned social media and that's very, um you know that's very interesting because you know you mentioned actually you may actually may mentioned making predictions and that and that requires um, social media. You know when you talk about social media, people will often dismiss it. Um, you know they'll say uh, uh, you know they'll say Twitter is not real life when they mean like you know it's not represent that pop opinion on Twitter is not representative of the general public. Uh, we're recording this on uh, April 29th, twenty twenty two. Uh, you know Elon Musk and Twitter. Elon Musk has agreed to buy Twitter. You know the the deal hasn't according to the stock market. The deal is not a certain uh, a certainty, but you know people are are treating it as some, something of a certainty that's going to happen. And then it comes the debate comes like you know are we thinking about this too much you know on, on twitter it's the biggest thing because it's, it's twitter and it's <laughs> it's elon musk um yeah. but um my experience i mean my experience I, i'm on twitter and i'm also in the public domain and i'm looking i'm paying attention to politics and i'm paying attention to newspapers and and you know my conclusion twitter is real life me or you we have some influence on serious people um I, we, you know, it, it wouldn't be anything close to what it is without Twitter. And like you just gave one example there, making predictions uh, that turn out to be true. Um, you know, there's risks sometimes predictions are, are, are false, but promoting your work, putting a face on it, um, getting it out there, uh, participating in that conversation where a lot of other people who are, you know, influential and who are, you know, the most prominent people in, uh, mm-hmm. in politics, that's where they are too. Um, you know, there's no, there's no, repl- there's no replacement to that. I, I think it's almost, you know, it's almost a, um, it's almost a, 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 you know, a social media press, almost a prerequisite to being influential in the marketplace of ideas now. Um, yeah. Do you have thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, 
Twitter, I, I think people may like underestimate the extent to which like Twitter has a sort of egalitarian effect. Yes. But what I mean by this is that, uh, especially when you're not properly credentials, credentials uh, about um, something that you're talking about, um, if you but adding a social media presence like on being on Twitter, uh, you know, if you if you don't say nonsense, if what you're saying despite the lack of proper credentials is actually interesting and relevant, some people are going to notice it. Like, you know, some people who are credentialed uh, in, in those fields, in those, in those issues, and they are going to notice it, so they're going to start following you, they're going to start talking and sharing your work, you know, retweeting your, uh, you know, tweet or thread, say, or uh, articles, or, you know, they're going to, even if they don't even recommend you to anyone, you know, on Twitter, like, you know, when you go on someone's profile, you can see who, who among you, the people you follow, follow that person. And I, my guess is that a lot of people, you know, um, they don't know you, but they know they, they see that a lot of people they follow and that they take seriously follow you. And it's gonna make you know, it's gonna make it much more likely they're gonna be like, okay, maybe if, if all of those people follow this guy, there may be something, you know, yeah. I may, may, maybe I mean, people like focus on is usually the amplification. Okay, a lot of trolls, a lot of stupid people, uh, you know, are good at self promotion. They can get ahead on Twitter. Uh, yeah, that's true. Um, that that's unquestionably true. Uh, but they don't focus on the yeah. They don't focus on the um, egalitarian effect. It, there's it's yeah. much less notice of. Okay, so now, we, now we I, can, I can I can tell you that like uh, you know talking about the egalitarian effect like to me it was kind of extraordinary because I remember joining Twitter and um, there are all those people whose books I was reading. People have been I, I never imagined you know ever that uh, I would end up like having like discussions with those people. Or like being like, uh, you know, on an equal footing. Yeah. And then you know, and it's kind of weird. You know, now I'm kind of gotten used, I've gotten used to it. But sometimes, you know, I, I, I think about it I'm like, oh, that's so weird. I'm having this like discussion with this guy, like, uh, I'm uh, whose book I was reading like three years ago. Yeah. And and I, I would never have imagined at the time, you know, that would end up like that. This guy would end up like sharing my work, or um, that I would end up like having debates with this guy, like again on, on equal footing. It's just weird because I'm, you know, I don't have. I mean, I'm just a nobody. Like, but, um, yeah, sure. As we were saying, you know, there are lots of trolls and people can like get a lot of followers on Twitter just by being trolls. Uh, but yeah, there are also, you know, if you do stuff that's not, um, like serious work, you can actually get people, important people and, you know, yeah. uh, influential people to, uh, to take you seriously and to engage with you. Even if they disagree, you know, like, you know, like I have some really interesting conversation with people I disagree with. Yeah. You can have real debates on, on Twitter. You can, you can actually get noticed uh, even when you're talking about something way outside your area of specialty. Yeah. And, and this is, yeah, this is something that I think is very important. And, stuff. And, uh, and, you know, if you don't have a lot of institutional resources, you can, to some extent, make up for that thanks to social media. So I think you're right that uh, it's a way, you know, that's how I think about it. I think, you know, it's, it's a lot of things. Social media and Twitter are a lot of things. But I think one thing they are, it's a way for people who don't have a lot of institu institutional resources to make up for this lack of institutional resources. Mm. Uh, it's, a, it's a way of like demultiplying uh, your, your influence when you, you, you lack those resources. I mean, if you do it, yeah, if you, if you do it right, if you do stuff, if you produce content that's actually interesting, uh, you can actually use it that way. You can actually get influence that you wouldn't have otherwise. And of course, you you can also do, get influenced by uh, doing stupid stuff, you know, like if, by being a troll and stuff, but that this shouldn't make us forget, you know, the other side. That yeah. You have, uh, well, it seems like there's a, there's a <clears throat> communication effect where it's like, it can make stupid, the stupid people stupider and it can make the smart people smarter. Right. Cause I think there's a, a good uh, case to be made that the great awakening was from social media because it starts around 2010, 2011. You look at when Twitter takes off, it's about that time. I mean, the timing lines up almost uh, pretty much perfectly. Um, and so that's, I think that's a nice example of social media making us stupider. Um, and then at the same time you do, we, you know, there's all the things that we're talking about, about the, uh, uh, you know, about the epidemiology and, you know, the talking back to experts and really discredit. I mean, the, the, the idea of expertise, it's like, it wasn't like three years, three or four years ago. It wasn't like, 
it wasn't like a thing that you doubt. It wasn't like the, the concept of expertise was not up for debate. Okay. You could say like some expert was wrong or someone was wrong, but the idea that like an entire like group of people like just has no idea what they're talking about. Um, I don't think that was like, that you could assume that as like a prior, like there's a new field you've never heard of uh, that. They're just, you know, they're just talking nonsense to each other and they're, they're, they're politicized and they're disconnected from the real world. I think people were considered kooks if they believed that uh, three or four years ago. Well, if you think like that now it's, it's like, you know, it's like a mainstream center, you know, center right uh, position, even on the left, you see criticism of experts and it, it's, it, it's, it's encouraging. Uh, I don't know. Do yeah. I wouldn't, go, I wouldn't go as far as saying it's mainstream, but it's certainly, uh, you know, it's certainly taken much more seriously by m way more people than it was like three years ago. Yeah, it's not, I mean, it uh, is. It is like a. It's the mainstream of the right, at least um, in the U.S. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, but, it, but also, you know, it, it, to be fair, you know, it can go too far. Like, you know, there is such a yeah. thing as expertise, and and uh, uh, and in fact, you know, you can argue that people. Well, you know, people spending, you know, experts spending nonsense are, are doing really a disservice to, because we need, you know, we need, you know, expert, you know, just like, uh, you know, we need experts, uh, we need experts, you know, you, you, you can't know, you know, everybody can't be an expert about everything. Yeah, yeah. There and has so, to be trust. There has to be ways for establishing and, and, and trust. And we need, yeah. and we need to have trustworthy signals, you know, like it's, that's what's, that's why credentials, you know, we, we can't, you can't do without credentials. I don't think, you know, uh, you know, you need some way of like knowing uh, who to listen to, you know, and like, uh, even if, of course, not going to be foolproof, but so, you know, that's, there's no way around this because again, you know, we have a limited amount of time uh, and you also, you know, you can't know about everything. So, um, but, uh, you know, the way I see it is that a lot of people, you know, especially, especially in the, the mainstream media, takes this too far, you know, have this like really naive view of expertise where you should like blindly trust people who have the proper credentials and completely ignore people who don't. And I think something like something like Twitter, like social media, um, uh, allows for a more nuanced like role of expertise because it allows for people who don't have the proper credentials to get some kind of recognition and to contribute to the conversation despite their lack of credentials, provided you know people who do have the right credentials are willing to give them a shot and then you know uh, recommend their work to other people because then uh, you know it, it sends the right signal for people. Who, uh, like journalists, for instance. Yeah. And then, so I think, yeah, I think it's incredibly important. And we talked about the bad, you know, you talked about the Great Awakening. I, I'd say, indeed, yeah, that's a good example of like a really, but, you know, assuming it is a, con this was, produ you know, this was a result of social media, which I agree is, is kind of plausible. I'm, I'm not sure it's true, but I'd be surprised if it didn't play a significant role at least. Uh, yeah, that's a good example of like a bad consequence of social media. But I think it's important to, you know, think about all the, the, the good effects it has to, because it has some. And uh, this is just one example. There are others, you know, I think, um, I mean, think about what it's like to be, um, to be a scientist today uh, compared to like, I don't know, 60 years ago in terms of like, for instance, knowing what's out there, you know, papers and stuff like 60 years ago, you would be like your department would be subscribing to a few journals. You would peruse the journals you receive every, every uh, other month, you know, mm. And you'd see a few papers. Um, you know, sometimes you'd run into a colleague at a conference who'd tell you about this other paper you didn't know about. It could take years before people, you know, knew about some important paper. And very often, some paper would get ignored, and like, um, even though it's, it was actually objectively very important. But, you know, just because the transmission of information was so inefficient, something like Twitter is kind of amazing. You know, like, you, so for instance, you write something, you post it, you get immediate feedback from people you know, who are, like, experts about this thing, uh, they will post, you know, immediately people would, like, give you references of other papers that are relevant to what you're discussing. Uh, whenever, like, a new paper comes out, it's going to be instantly discussed, you know, uh, and you're, you're much more likely to know about it right away. Like, the, the, the speed at which uh, relevant information is being transmitted is, like, has been, like, you know, yeah. increased by a lot by this stuff, and I and I have to believe that it's, this is going to have some effect on you know the production of knowledge in the long run because we're now in a completely just because of something like Twitter, I think we're in a completely different environment um, with respect to this. You know, not just so it's not just with it doesn't just help with stuff like uh, allowing you know making it easier for people from outside of of a given field to make contribution to that field. Mm -hmm. um, 
this is a uh, yeah this is really uh, uh an underappreciated aspect of that stuff yeah because yeah people only think about the dumb the dumb stuff and you know of course the dumb stuff exists um, yeah Okay. So yeah, we've been talking a lot about the the dumb stuff and you know bad things in uh, sort of science communication and, and academia and uh, yeah, I think I think we'll close on on that that more hopeful note. Thanks for being yeah. on. Thanks for having me.